Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Charlie Dixon. My guest today is Raj Sundar. Raj is a full spectrum family medicine physician and community organizer and the host for Healthcare for Humans, a podcast dedicated to educating others on how to care for culturally diverse communities so that they can be better healers. Raj works with others to create systems that treat each person with dignity, respect their histories, celebrate their joys, and honor their hopes. We're excited to have Raj with us today to discuss cultural competency and his work with Healthcare for Humans. I'm so glad to have you here with us today, Raj. Welcome to our show. Thanks for having me, Shirley. So as we get started, can you share with us how you got into the healthcare field and what brought about the idea to do the podcast, Healthcare for Humanity? I like to start by saying being a physician is a family trade for for me because my father's a doctor, my mom is, my aunts, my cousins, all of them are in India. And there's a story behind that where my grandfather, who did suffer from real poverty, believed that the way out of it was to educate his children to become doctors in India. And then my father came here along with my mother, and then I trained to become a physician here in the United States. I'll say after getting into the medical profession, it has been very disappointing at the beginning (laughs) because the promise of caring for and healing patients often it's very difficult in the entrenched healthcare systems that we're all part of. Every system does its best to heal and care for patients, but because of a complex set of variables, including financial incentives, prior beliefs on what healthcare should look like, we're at a place where often patients are disappointed Healthcare providers are burnt out. I think in any field, it could be primary care, mental health care, anywhere. And part of this burnout for me was feeling like I wasn't caring for my patients in the way that I had wanted to, specifically patients who were different from me, because that gap felt even more palpable. And that's what led me on a journey to at least figure out for myself what it looked like to care for them better. And when there wasn't anywhere that I could see that was easily identifiable where I could learn and become that clinician I wanted, I decided to create something of my own. Nice. Okay. Okay. And so in, in the creation of what would be your own, that is what I'm assuming is your podcast. How did you start it? Like where, where did it come from? Yeah, it's called healthcare for humans. And I had started it. I had started it initially because I love listening to podcasts. I don't have to preach to the choir. We're doing a podcast. You all are hosts and producers. <laughs> but I, I also have two kids, so I couldn't read or learn in other ways. I couldn't take two days off to go to California and sit in a conference. I'm sure my wife would not be happy with that. It might have been still fun for me. So podcast became a way for me to stay connected to continuing medical education Initially, though, I literally listened to murder mysteries and fun podcasts, but then I realized there's a whole niche of actively learning topics through this way. Then I thought, hey, it seems so accessible these days to create things. How do I create a podcast that is specifically geared towards what I was starting to learn, which is the history and culture of the different communities that I was caring for outside of the medicine part, because I knew that informed how I cared for people so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. So going back just a little bit, can you give us your idea of what cultural competency is? What does that look like in the medical profession? Is it something that's taught? How do you get it? What is it? There are probably so many definitions around this topic because people know it's important. They've been studying it for decades. So I'm going to approach it and answer it in a way that is personal to me and how I felt it and what has led me to understand what cultural safety means. So my understanding of cultural competence in my experience in medical school was I learn about different culture profiles. Each culture has some profile. I understand how people say hello, what they dress like. Maybe they have three or four values that is really strong. 
and important in their culture. And then I check that off my list. Okay, I got it. That's it. And then when I care for them, I refer back to that profile once in a while. And then there's still some friction, but hey, we did the best we could. We're just different. That was my understanding of cultural competency. And there are so many problematic parts to it, just in the way I recalled it. This idea of mastery, how sure. you could master a culture, the idea of it being a checklist. Hey, I took a module on the culture, so I should know it enough, right? And this othering where cultural competency in itself, often when it's taught is I'm normal and these cultures are different and abnormal. Not always, but it is, hey, healthcare has got this amazing scientific solutions to everything, but these cultures sometimes don't understand it. How can I overcome their values to make sure they understand this amazing thing we have to offer? And I'm saying that in tongue in cheek a bit, but sometimes implicit in some of those modules is overcoming people's beliefs and values to provide them with care, which isn't necessarily centering the community at all. There's been a lot of work around this. People are probably familiar with the term cultural humility, which centers on yourself more because we all bring our own values and beliefs. So bringing that part addresses some of the problematic components of the foundational understanding of cultural competency. And then the cultural safety piece is that in New Zealand with the Maori population, which is the indigenous population, they had really advocated for a different sense of culture, which is that there are embedded power structures between cultures as well, specifically with indigenous populations who've been decimated in so many countries that we need to talk about the power as well. So the cultural safety says, Yes, it's about patterns, patterns of beliefs, values, because it's just a pattern. Not every single individual is going to hold that, but also the power, like how much power do we feel we have to advocate for what we want, to speak up in the clinic rooms, to speak up in intakes. So how do you address that and help people feel safe enough to share their vulnerabilities? Nice, nice. Now, being someone who is not necessarily of the majority ethnicity in America, how do you think that that plays into the ideas that you have around cultural competency? And how do you think that you portray that in your podcast? There's two perspectives I could take with this. One is there are actually a lot of Indians in healthcare. So part of what I have mixed and ambivalent feelings when somebody says I'm underrepresented from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. But it's true when I came as an immigrant, I had that experience of being Indian because I came when I was eight years old, which is an interesting time to come because you had learned enough of what your home culture is, which is Indian. And then you have to reinvent yourself in a new country where you're still young enough that you feel like it's completely possible. And it's like little things like my accent, which I don't have, maybe a Southern accent because I grew up in North Carolina and I still say y'all all the time. But my, you know, my, my parents, <laughs> yeah, my, my parents still have an accent. And so it is really noticeable for when they interact with other people that, hey, you're not from here, right? That sense that people get. But because I was an immigrant and had to reassess what was important to me, I had to think about what were my values and my fundamental beliefs about the world on how things work and what's important. And because of that questioning and reinventing, I've always had a sense, I think a lot of immigrants, a lot of people new to the communities or cultures they're coming into, just have built awareness of other people's experiences too. And I think that's helped me when I'm listening, not to superimpose my own identity and beliefs, because I'm able to truly take somebody else's position because I could reflect back on what that felt like to me. Gotcha. I agree. So earlier you mentioned burnout and, and I took a second to write that down because I do believe, especially in healthcare, the burnout is real with, with the pandemic being over, so to speak, with COVID-19. How do you think that burnout in the medical field, how does that affect cultural competency or does it? It definitely does because people end up being less caring, less of their best selves when they're burnt out. Mm -hmm. So it's just hard to take an extra step when you're already feeling overwhelmed with providing what we quote unquote say medical care, diagnosing you with the pneumonia, giving you antibiotics, everything seems overwhelming. So taking that extra step to understand the person and their place in their culture seems like a lot. So it, it affects that. I also want to note that burnout is complex and there's so many intermediate stages 
this is another field that's so heavily studied because there's so much burnout in healthcare. And we know what it does not fix it, which is yoga classes and free pizza, <laughs> which people love doing. Uh, and there's a core part of being overworked that's part of burnout. For for me, I think in the work that I'm doing, a protective factor is connection. Connection with the work and the people that I'm caring for. I'm able to build that connection and relationship when I understand their culture better. So they feel, hey, this person knows me or cared enough to learn about me. So I'm going to go to a place that I haven't gone to with other people. I'll share an example. The example that exemplified this, it happened now probably a year ago, but it sticks with me so much because I had known this couple for a while, actually helped deliver their baby too. And it was right around New Year's. They were Ethiopian, but in the Ethiopian calendar, it's a whole different calendar, <laughs> meaning it is not New Year's, New Year's. It's like 2015, I think this year is. Yeah. And New Year's is actually Christmas. Like I think this week is their Christmas right now. So I learned about that and I had brought that up to my patient and there was a sense of surprise because everyone else through that whole visit were like, happy new year's, happy new year's. Cause nobody really knew that it wasn't that for them. So when I mentioned, Hey, I, I'm pretty sure it's Christmas for you, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. They're like, oh, like, oh, you know about that? They're, so there's this like, oh, surprise. And hey, like, how did you know about that? <laughs> so, and then they started sharing me about their experiences. And it was a joyful moment, kind of unexpected. But I got to learn some of the traditions. And it was such a big part of their life during that period. We just talked about so many other things outside of medicine, but it helped build that connection. And then whatever we talked about with medical care was that much more meaningful because there's also trust because that's another piece we talk a lot about. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little later in this conversation too. Right. Right. And so I guess speaking from the other side of that, or, or maybe is is a bad thing about all of it, what, what are cultural ruptures? I keep hearing about cultural ruptures happening in healthcare. So what are they? Are they the the evidence that there isn't cultural competency? Educate us on that. It can, I'm taking a pause here because I feel like ruptures can look like so many different ways and you probably have experienced it because we all hold a multi-layered identity of who we are as a person, mm -hmm. anywhere from being from rural America and showing up of a big academic health center to being a woman and being dismissed mm -hmm. about your complaints, right? That identity piece and showing up and feeling like because of your identity, you're not being given the best care possible. And when it comes to cultures, that happens in such obvious and harmful ways that everybody in the room can feel it. There's this tension. See, and there's not just implicit bias. There's explicit conflict sometimes. One specific situation that I wrote about a while ago was with reproductive care, specifically in pregnancy. When I was caring for a, a patient, I was in the periphery of this team, so I was in the core attending provider, but we we're taking care of a, a OB patient who was Somali, who wanted to have a vaginal delivery, but the clinical care team believed that C-section was the right way forward. And in that moment, it became so tense, the team started to judge the patient's decision mm -hmm. in a way that there was a rupture. What that means is they started to question if she actually loved her baby, right? It seems crazy now for me to say it out loud like that. But what happened was the team was worried the baby was intolerating labor. They wanted to have a C-section right now, right away. The mother felt, hey, I really trust that I will have a vaginal delivery and I'm going to put it in God's hands. There's so much to unpack there. There's clearly different ways of thinking of what will be the best step to care for this baby. But as the team became more and more worried, there was less and less respect for the patient. So they would march into the patient's room, sometimes without even a cultural mediator and say, you need to have a C-section right now, or you're going to kill your baby. Right. And there's so many, again, underlying assumptions of what the mother's feeling and no way to even think about her perspective. 
that caused this rupture. Ultimately, she ended up having a C-section. She was okay. Baby was okay. But afterwards, she forever questions if a healthcare system can care for her. So you can imagine what she's going to share with their family, what she's going to share with their community, what she's going to share with their children. And that has wide ranging and far reaching consequences. So that one cultural rupture, because how it um, manifested has mm -hmm. rippling effects throughout the community. I'm going to reflect back on the question because that is a cultural rupture also because there's not a clear solution to it. I think that conflict would have existed no matter who was in that room, mm -hmm. but there could have been more respect. There's could have been more connection. And somehow we probably would have gotten to the same place without the animosity and questioning somebody's values around their own child. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Whether you're a longtime or first time listener to Behavioral Health Today, you're probably familiar with Triad, the company that brings you this podcast. But you may not know that Triad also hosts a community for current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, featuring trending content and education and career resources, all for free. If you are a behavioral or mental health professional, or you're studying to become one, join more than 80,000 people on Triad by claiming your free professional account today. Visit us at hellotriad.com slash bht. That's hellotriad.com slash bht. And join the Triad community today. Right. That is that is quite powerful, that story. Um, I, I have to say that I've um, been in a similar place. So I could I can imagine uh, what it was like for her and especially for you as her healthcare professional as well. So you mentioned how to word things and how to question your patients. Can you enlighten us on what that looks like? How do you approach questioning in a way to um, really respect someone else's culture? I'm thinking about even asking about people's ethnicities these days, because I was talking to somebody and it was a provider who said, well, I just took a bias module and I thought we couldn't ask people what they are. I'm like, yeah, don't ask people what they are. It's like, I don't know what that means. It's like, what are you? Right? Like, of course, nobody wants to have a question of what are you? It's like, like, right. you know, like if you give context on, you know, sometimes, and I'm still workshopping because everybody's different of like, Hey, it really helps me to understand what communities you're part of. And I would love to know, are you Ethiopian? I mean, sometimes I have clues, you know, so I mentioned something that I noticed and you have to be careful, right? Because you don't want to stereotype, right? but somehow eliciting what's important to them and their identity can help inform how you care for them because it is part of their identity. So it could right. be name, it could be language. So if somebody speaks, you know, Amharic, you know, that's obviously flu and I'll be like, hey, which part of Ethiopia are you from? Or am I misunderstanding where you're from? So I think there's more gentler and humble ways to approach that question to understand where somebody's coming from. And there's also context you can provide, hey, it helps me care for you better. It's not going to determine how I treat you, but I would love to know because I think we can build a better relationship if we both uh, understand each other's identities. Because I think there's a real reluctance for people now that's they've been in the healthcare system a lot from because of situations that I just told you about. There's going to be um, bias and racism because now uh, you know that I hold that identity. Maybe you had a bad experience. You're not going to actually give me the care you would have given to that white person back there. Right. right. So can it gets so complex, but approaching it with humility and centering the individual in front of you over a period of time is always helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and being able to actually voice that I want to check in with you to see how it feels to be in your world. How can you help me see it from your side? Absolutely agree with you. Yeah. So in, in that same vein, what kind of work or what sort of work are you encouraging to your peers? How do you help others through the podcast to be more culturally competent, more culturally sensitive? First is understanding what communities you're part of. I think we're becoming increasingly isolated yeah. from our place-based work because we just go to the place where we do our work and then go home. Some people do connect with community, but you know, people's neighborhoods and 
what cultures are around you. It takes some work to do that. Like connecting with the community center here in Washington state, we have health boards, which are intermediary boards between public health and healthcare systems. So do you know the health boards or the people who lead that and what they're doing, especially if you take care of a large Ukrainian population? Or for me, as I noted, I take care of a lot of Ethiopian population. So I, I know the Ethiopian leaders around this community, which is really helpful. So that step of understanding what communities you're part of is the first one. And then seeing what does it mean to build a relationship with that community? Because ultimately, you don't want to burden the individual or patient in front of you to teaching you everything about their community. Yeah. Right. This is all a dance because you don't want to stereotype every single individual you see into this community's mm -hmm. narrative. At the same time, nobody wants to explain everything that's happened in their history and context. So, for example, you know, another example that I use that speaks to a specific part of this is with the Native Hawaiian population that we care for in the Pacific Northwest and how for many folks in that community, they were kicked out of Hawaii because of tourism and how houses became really expensive and they can't even visit their family now. And many, many people in this area, when they learn you're a native Hawaiian, say, I was just in Hawaii the other day mm -hmm. and don't understand how that statement, which is a microaggression, yes, but there's so much context to it, right? If right. you knew you were talking to a person who got kicked out of their home and can't visit their family, and you tell them you're going on vacation to Hawaii all the time, it's not a way to build relationship and it's actively building distrust. So part of the work was educating clinicians on the Native Hawaiian community's experience on how they came to this area and what they're struggling with right now and their mental health. Because especially with the Native Hawaiian population, like with many indigenous populations, connection to land and ancestors is so important which we dismiss, or it's such a small part of, you know, I don't know, the quote unquote American values, I'll say. So it's hard for people to understand, but so it's like a mental health crisis in some ways, because they can't go back to the place where your ancestors lived in and gave you life. And understanding that then you have that empathy, you don't commit some of those errors that I just talked about, but you also have a richer understanding when you talk to somebody about their mental health and you're working with solutions for them outside of just the CBT, here's some antidepressants. Hey, have you yeah. tried going to, you know, a community center, right? Now you can also say, hey, for many people in the community, I know it's been hard not to connect with their family. Does this resonate with you? Is this true for you too? Right. And being able to know enough about what is available to share that with your with your patients. So yeah. it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is really changing the mindsets of not just your peers, but your patients that you're seeing. Are you do you experience any backlash or negativity or your colleagues not really necessarily have any buy in to what you're you're trying to teach and change? Always right. with this work, there always yeah. is hesitancy, resistance, mm -hmm. because, hey, I'm a doctor. What do I need to know this stuff? Yep. I'm just here to treat people and everybody's this. Everybody's a human and we study the human body. I don't know how many phrases right. can I say like that. Right. 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 And we're all uh, the same. Yeah. Yep. We're blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's well worth the conversation. And this is with just equity work overall, same with culturally uh, responsive work and cultural safety that I talk about. There's people who just weren't aware and when they learn, they do change their behavior and that makes a huge difference. There's some, some people it's worth having the conversation with, not to dismiss anybody's experience, but some who are probably distracting you from the work. And this takes some wisdom to know. And I think mm -hmm. you as a uh, community and group have to do that work together. So ultimately you're treating the patients in the community better. So yes, there's been resistance with clinicians. With patients, the thing to be more most mindful about is stereotyping. So I've had positive experiences with this too, but I'm always in my in my head saying, am I saying something that's ending up putting people in a box and in a way that that they don't identify with? So going back to because it's such a big community here. There's a lot of conflict with the Eritrean community and the Tigridia and the Ethiopian community, and there were some wars um, and conflict there. 
So I brought this up to an individual who had a Tigrinya identity, who was feeling like they were being persecuted in Ethiopia. I brought it up because I had understood this conflict and I said, Hey, you know, I heard about this protest going on about the Tigranian community. You know, you speak Amharic, but something doesn't, something feels different in this conversation. Cause then I don't know how exactly how I worded it, but he talked about how, yes, like I haven't called myself Ethiopian in the last five years. I say Tigranian. So thanks for like, asking me about that because it feels important to me. But it is not something I bring up with anybody that I feel like holds an Ethiopian identity, like stereotyping this mental health part of connection to their country. So what is the actual thing that I'm trying to say? <laughs> it's just can be personalized and individual, which is almost always easier in the context of relationship. Some people don't have luxury of that. You see them one time only and for yep. small moments of time, and you have to do your best to first not stereotype. I'm doing that because first do no harm is what's always right. taught in medicine. And I think because how, how communities have been harmed by racism and inequities, like we need to start with that lens and then attempt to connect culturally if it's important to them. Using myself as an example, I'm from Tamil Nadu, which is South India, which is really different from North India. If somebody's uh, knew I was Indian and started talking to me about chicken tikka masala and Bollywood, like, listen, South India is really different <laughs> and I don't love you imposing what you know, basics about India on me, <laughs> which has happened, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I think what I would have preferred is to somebody to talk to me about, hey, do I feel strongly connected to my Indian identity? I'm like, yeah, I have a mix. You know, I grew up in America for a long time. But my family's still in India, and I think there's a kind of a reclaiming of identity. I think it happens with a lot of immigrants that I'm going through. So I feel a little more connected, but I'm from South India. So I don't know if you know anything about South India, right? So like that, that conversation looks different because you're open for a longer period of time exploring somebody's identity. Nice, nice. I really appreciate the fact that you are you discuss exploring somebody's identity. And I don't know, not that I necessarily have a, a, a ton of friends that are doctors, but it is nice to hear that that is where you start your conversation with your patients. That's that's very refreshing. So, can you share a, a hallmark story of how understanding somebody's worldview can better help you better care for patients? And what you know, what does that look like? I shared several stories and a common theme is empathy and compassion for people, who, like what they've gone through as communities and individuals. I think it's helpful to remember that I think it's true in mental health, right? So much of the maladaptive behaviors we've learned was adaptive at some point to a stressor in your life. And that's true with communities too. If you're outside of the community, it's not your role to see what's maladaptive. <laughs> It's the community's work and they can define in this new context what it looks like for them to thrive. But you need to have empathy on this belief, this value. This was important for the community for some reason. You have a cursory understanding of it, but you don't really know the extent of it. And that goes a, a long way to avoid judgment because I see that a lot when people don't follow what you think is sound advice. So for example, in the Ukrainian uh, and Russian community, one thing is like not combining those is really important, but so I think sometimes it still happens. For the Ukrainian community, uh, this resistance, resistance is what sometimes people in healthcare would say, but this reluctance to get preventive screening. That has a huge backstory because I've talked to many patients who are saying, hey, like, I don't know how much longer I've lived. I'm feeling fine right now. Why do I need to do this and spend time? And I don't have the money for this anyway, because your insurance is really bad. <laughs> it's like right. they have a lot of good reasons for why they don't. But from a healthcare standpoint, it is behind on preventive screenings. Didn't get her breast cancer screening, didn't get her pap smear, clearly doesn't care about her health, right? Like or else she would be doing this. So right. if she gets breast cancer, it's her own fault. You know, we told you so many times to get it, mm -hmm. right? This It goes there because yeah, it's like, it's it not our fault. Well, like what? So I think just building empathy from the start, and then you're able to reach patients, even if they have these values or skepticism around preventive care, because when you build that relationship that's built on trust, sometimes they decide to choose something else because of you. 
that is like the best case scenario because of a context you've created, because you helped them understand, hey, in this area, preventive care is important and we know it's really helpful for you. And I know insurance is a problem. Let's see if there are resources to address that. Maybe there aren't, but let's work together and try to figure that out. So for example, with diabetes, this happens so much for me and for people who do understand diabetes who don't, either way, A1C of greater than 6.5 is diabetes, which is an average blood sugar in your blood for the last three months or so. So A1C of nine or 10 is really bad. A1C of 11 or 12 is really, really bad. And I have some patients in the Pacific Islander community who have A1C of 11. I have some patients in the Kamai community who have A1C of 11. Mm -hmm. And I've seen messages from other providers because I know them well who judge them so hard because, hey, you're going to die. It's going to be your fault when you get a stroke, when you can't see. You know, we told you what to do this. And the story I have here is I have a, I had a Kamai patient who didn't want to treat her diabetes because she was really scared of injecting herself because she's carries a lot of internal trauma from the Kamai Rouge. And there's a lot of backstory to it, but the needle provoked a lot of, a lot of fears and anxiety. So she just couldn't, and we didn't have many options for her because the pills, there were just too many and it wasn't as effective as we wanted to. But I was, I was with her for so long through different periods of time, through different losses in her family. And it was a pivotal ER visit when she couldn't see because her blood sugar was so bad, she almost was blind. And then they gave her insulin at the ER visit to bring her sugar down and her eyesight got a little better. But that was so real to her and like she valued and she felt how hard it was to go through that. And she was also, it was getting harder for her to care for her family members, which was also important to her because she was providing a lot of care that she decided and worked through trying to do insulin little by little. And over a period of time, we were finally able to get it under control which is a success story. And it's not always mm-hmm. like that, but it's a, such a pivotal story because it like brings me so much joy and so much energy to do, doing this work. Cause it's like, man, like I just stuck with you. No judgment. You know, I'm here. We're going to keep having this conversation. Cause that's my job. I'm sorry. I'm going to keep telling you, you need this. Are you ready? Are you ready? And then when somebody is ready, because sometimes factors outside of your control, when you're there, you're able to make that change. And being that in a culturally responsive way can be really helpful for a lot of patients. Absolutely. And it sounds like the perfect marriage, so to speak, of trust and connection and just your observance of and knowledge of her culture and where she comes from and being accepting of the things that she's, you know, endured in her life. That's quite powerful. Quite powerful. So can you leave us with a final message, perhaps something that's going on in the medical field right now, addressing the gaps between clinicians and the lives of their patients? There's a lot of work being done in healthcare. Being in leadership, it's actually dizzying. I think there's still a problem with progress in healthcare. And I strongly believe it's partly system, but also partly leaders in healthcare. So if you're listening and you don't know if you want to go into leadership, but you're listening to this, I want you to consider it because we need a lot of good people to make the changes that we want. And the take home message from the work that I'm doing, going back to Shirley, what we talked about earlier was reflecting for yourself, what does it mean to build a healing relationship with that individual in front of you? And what all do you need to know? So you're not burdening that person in front of you to explain everything. And that could look different in different communities. I think for me, podcasting was the way to do it because I already listened to podcasts. It was fun. I like to create things. And it gave me a conduit to build relationships with the community because after you talk to somebody for like an hour or two you somehow become friends because <laughs> it's a long time to talk <laughs> to each other <laughs> right, right. Um, so it's been helpful in that way for me Absolutely. So I know I personally was able to find your podcast and and I guess some some things on social media, mainly on Instagram. And so I had to kind of scroll through, saw a few of the things that you were posting there, listen to a few tidbits. But where can our listeners learn more about you, learn more about your work, the podcast? The best place is healthcareforhumans.org. The website has uh, links to all the podcasts. Obviously, it's a podcast, so it's in all podcast players. 
Um, we do have an Instagram account that has some clips from the podcast, uh, but mostly for me, I'm focusing on one place, which is LinkedIn to build out um, ways to communicate as I'm learning things. Because I think that's what happens. You all are podcasters too. We have so many of these conversations. I uh, thought about it one time, like I'm learning so much. I know I'm trying to like share it, but I need to condense it and reflect it in a way that I can communicate easily. So my hope is for 2024, for to do that because I know people digest information in different ways. Uh, not everybody loves podcasts like I do. I still don't know why, <laughs> but for <laughs> everybody else, uh, short written form and things like that. Nice, nice. And so given that, make sure listeners, you check Raj out on LinkedIn. I know that I will be um, looking for you there because now I have some additional questions um, and things that <laughs> I can work with my own clients with. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and thank you, Raj, for being here with us on our show today. It has been a great time chatting with you. You as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for joining Raj and I. The resources for this episode and an archive of all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. And we look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.